Hey everybody. Oh. I'm so glad to be here. It's exciting to be talking to you at the nearly end of the day, but not quite. Um, so I, I was a little I was a little startled um, when I got this invitation to speak at the tenth Games for Change Festival. I was at the first festival, which was it was really a lunch. Let's be honest. It was a it was a networking lunch, and there were like 40 people or 20 people or something, and it was very nice. And then the second one was way the hell up in Washington Heights. And I've been to most of the rest, too. Um, and and it's, it's always nice to come up for this event. Uh, but I was also kind of startled because those 10 years mark a, a lot of my professional career doing wh whatever it is that, that we do. Um, I started uh, Persuasive Games on my studio back in 2003. And I started teaching at Georgia Tech in, in 2004. And that was the same year that we had the first Games for Change event, so gosh, there's a, kind of a lot of a lot of stuff going on for, for all of us, and, and me in particular, in the past 10 years. And over the course of that decade, as I was kind of reflecting on this, as I prepared this talk, I realized, you know, I've kind of been saying the same thing the whole time. Um, something like, you know, games have a unique power to depict and explain complexity, and that this, this power has the potential to positively impact the way that we think about and address complex social and political issues, and I make this argument many, many, many times every year in front of audiences uh, like you. Uh, and so today I wanted to make a slightly different version of, of that same argument and kind of go meta on it, uh, be a little more self-aware and, and self-critical of the sorts of things that, um, that all of us say, and me, me included. So the way that this argument typically goes for me is that I'll say something like this. Unlike television and blogs and TED Talks and even many long-form books and articles these days, games are the one popular medium that embrace complexity rather than shying away from it. Games endorse and even require systems thinking, which is one name for understanding the world as a complex network of interconnected parts. And that sounds, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, but, you know, I can't help but wonder, if, why am I making this same argument? Ten, 10 years later, um, and it's not, even, it's not even 10 years, it's a lot longer than that. Others have been making this same argument for a lot longer. The, the, the notion of serious games started with Clark Apt in the late 1960s, with Chris Crawford in, in the mid-80s talking about games of this kind, Ben Sawyer and Dave Rajewski kind of reviving serious games in 2000, and, and a lot more uh, in between. And, and I think over the past decade in particular, we've all been running headlong into a very specific kind of paradox. Uh, and, and the idea that games are windows onto complexity uh, as depictions of these interconnected systems, this idea is sort of forced to reject structurally the very idea, the very notion of dramatic, revolutionary, disruptive change. And that kind of idea drives most of our contemporary understanding about technology or maybe about anything at all. So, you know, real systems thinking assumes that simple answers are always wrong. Yet, games for change, or serious games, or whatever you want to call them, are still often presented as these sort of superficially transformative affairs. So here's, here's what I mean. This is a headline about this very conference that we are at right now, from last week on Fast Company. Games are changing the world. And I, I have to admit, and, and maybe this is just me, but when people start talking about changing the world, I, I check to see if I still have my wallet. <laughs> but in, in the case of games, I think if they were really changing the world, then a headline like this wouldn't be possible. If we were really succeeding at what we purport to be doing here, then the very idea of changing the world as a simple principle would have been revealed to be anathema to video games. And that rejection of some, in addition to checking for your wallet, maybe you, know, you should also check to see if there are any, uh, any games involved in, in those world-changing games. Or if there's just the idea of games, the concept of an unrealized potential in games that we might someday meet, or, or maybe not, since we're not really under the gun to actually make the games that we say we are. So examples like this got me thinking about uh, serious games again. And, and I was also you know, reflecting on the fact that 10 years ago, that term was, was, was rising in popularity. I mean, it was, really, it was really the kind of thing you would hear as often as you might hear the awful word gamification today. Uh, and I've been, I've been a critic of, of this term, of this term serious games, uh, despite the fact that I'm often identified as a, as a proponent and a developer of them. 
And, and part of that gripe, which I laid out in, in a book called Persuasive Games, was, was twofold. For one, I worry that, that serious games unreasonably try to separate entertainment and seriousness, whatever that is, into this kind of binary, which doesn't seem, doesn't seem so convincing. And then for another part, uh, serious games seem largely to represent the goals of institutions, like military, government, corporate interests, education. They're sort of institutional games. Uh, and, and actually, when Games for Change started in 2004, uh, that same sort of thing kind of applied to this organization too, but it was focused on the nonprofit uh, social impact sector rather than the, the governmental or corporate one. And, you know, and on the one hand, this is, this is fine. I mean, institutions ought to make and use games too. There's nothing wrong with it. But the, the dirty truth about most of these serious games um, the one that nobody wants to talk about in public is that they, they don't really, they're not really that concerned about being games. I mean, it's, it's fine if a game emerges from the serious games design process, I suppose. But mostly because games are uh, hip. You know, they make appealing peaks in your grant application. Uh, they offer sort of new terrain. We can say, oh, look at the undiscovered country that we're exploring and figuring out how to use and that's why I want to pursue this project. I don't know what's going to happen. They sort of justify in advance the fact that we know we won't succeed. Um, they give us you know, new reasons to pursue existing programs in order to keep them running and so forth. And, and actually, we see this elsewhere, too. And, and I wonder if, you know, for all the talk of how or why or in what way games can be art, maybe the most widespread kind of games as art is actually the almost universal use of non-entertainment games as conceptual art. And here begins, I warn you, a small digression on conceptual art. So, I mean, you all know, uh, you all know this piece, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, which is the best known of his series of, of ready-mades, which were borrowed, manufactured objects. And the idea was that the selection and contextualization was sufficient to make something art. And there's lots of these, other, remember Rauschenberg's telegram declaring this is a, a portrait if I say so. And, Manzoni's air and shit inside a can. And, and then there's Fluxus, which was a, a 1960s movement noted for blending media with a, a strong focus on the kind of Dadaist, anti-art, and conceptualist traditions that had already been begun by, by Duchamp and others. And, and one trend in Fluxus were these disrupted chess sets. This is Spice Chess. And this is a very famous piece by Yoko Ono uh, from 1966 called A Play It by Trust, or otherwise known as White Chess Set. Uh, and she claims to be making this sort of fundamental change rather than just a decorative change to the game. And life is not all black and white. And so you know, work has been taken as a kind of anti-war sentiment. And, and, and when you look at the way that Ono talks about her work, and she says something like this, you know, she partly means that the artwork ought to be able to live beyond the gallery of the museum. But like all the conceptualists, the means to that end strips the work of most of its actuality transforms it into this idea, this idea for contemplation alone. But white chess isn't really meant to be played or, or even to be touched. It's, it's an idea. And, and at the end of the day, you, know, you might say that, that white chess is no more used for chess than fountain is for urination. And likewise, I would say that you know, most games for change or most serious games are no more used for gameplay than fountain is for urination. They're, they're concepts at worst and adornments at best. So, um, and you know, I, I, as, as I reflected in preparation for this on, on some of the ideas that I set out before, I, I fell back on, on, on some, of the, some of the things I'd written about this issue back in 2006 and 2007. And I, I went through, in, in this book called Persuasive Games, many alternate takes on the serious, on the word serious, in serious games. And one of the suggestions I made is that serious games ought to be serious in the sense of, of cheesecake. Uh, so that, like, you know, when you say, dude, that is a serious cheesecake, right? <laughs> in, in that case, serious means two things. There's a kind of care and an attention to detail, and there's, there's this desire and, 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 and realization of a thing's fundamental structure. Like, this is the apotheosis of cheesecake. You have realized it, right? The form of cheesecake is represented here. So you know, if we imagine like serious as in cheesecake games, uh, what they would do is expose the underlying structure of something with an interest in really focusing the player on that something deeply and meaningfully in order to produce you know, true attention and deliberation. And you know, this sounds like a novel idea until you realize, oh no, actually that's just what good game designers do all the time. 
Uh, so the interesting thing about Will Wright, for example, as a designer, is not that he's a you know, particularly talented game designer, although he might be, but that he has all these interests, and he pursues those interests and expresses them in game form, and he's pretty good at it. You know, so Sim City was uh, kind of an expression of Wright's interest in J. Forrester's urban dynamics, and Sim Earth, a way of exploring uh, the Gaia hypothesis, and Sim Ant was a reflection on E.O. Wilson's sociobiological behavior theory, and The Sims had all sorts of influences, you know, you, you, the, the Sims is influenced by Alexander and Maslow and Michael Underhill, and even, even the comparatively less successful game, Spore, uh, owes a debt to Lovelock's idea of the Gaia Spore, the notion that life might more likely reproduce in the universe through space colonization rather than through random hazard. And so these are all commercial games, successful games, interesting games, games we love, that took as their premise, or at least their starting point, someone's interest, someone's interest in something in the universe. So I, I don't know if we want serious games or, or games for change so much as we want games that first really want to be games, and second, that really want to pursue the topics and subjects and experiences they claim to pursue, that don't exist primarily or even significantly to create attention or to produce the opportunity to lecture about them or to write grants about them or to get jobs dealing with them or to book deals or whatever. You know, maybe what we really want are uh, not serious games, but but earnest games, you know, games that mean it. Games that aren't half-hearted in their effort to be games or to be games about something important to their creators and to the world. Games that aren't just instrumental or opportunistic in their intentions. And, and you know, we're starting to see more of these games emerge all the time. Games like Papers, Please, and Dysphoria, and Cart Life succeed partly because they were made outside of the rhetorical bubble that sometimes surrounds our community. They were made with the intention that they be played, and made such that their playing is principally directed toward the subjects that they seek to illuminate, to engage with seriously, if you want to use that word again, from you know, the, the malaise of menial labor to the ambiguous complicity of autocracy to the social discomfort of hormone replacement therapy. These are games about those subjects because their people, their, their creators wanted to make games about those subjects. So I'm, I'm not the first to make this point, but it's actually a little weird to talk about using games for social change or for seriousness in the abstract. I mean, we don't talk about other media that way, like books or film or macrame or whatever. We just kind of assume that it's possible, right? We just do it. I want to make a film about this thing, so I'm going to go figure out a way to make a film about the thing I want to make a film about. And, and as welcome as any community is, and I really do welcome community, 10 years hence, I don't know that we need serious games or games for changes as frames. I don't know that they're useful anymore. I, I think we want something like earnest games instead. Games, games that really mean it. And games for which it matters that they mean it. And, and not just this week or this year, but games that aspire to do justice to their topics and to the medium of games itself. These are games that we really want to play, that we seek out, that we can play more than once and they still put a lump in our throats. They're games that we roll around in our hands and on our phones and in our heads and that stop us short because of what we really found in them, not what we read about them. Because they showed us some part of the world that we hadn't seen before, or that we hadn't seen in that way, and they do it because their creators were generous enough to want to speak to us. But then, instead of speaking to us, which is so much easier than making games, they went to the stupid, improbable, absurd lengths of building these rusty machines that are games, and offering that to us instead. And that we play because, not because they make good headlines, but because uh, they meant it, and because we can see that in them. So over the next 10 years, uh, let's, make, let's make those games instead. Thanks. Maybe we don't need to make a living making games as government contractors. 
right? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've done this too. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. But you know, if we really want to make games and the opportunities that emerge in which we can make them turn out to lead us down a path in which we can only make sucky games, then we, we at least need to admit to ourselves that that's the situation. That this is purely instrumental. That really we're doing this because we have to make a living somehow. We might as well make it in this fashion. And I mean, I don't know. Some people find that gratifying because the problems of consulting can be gratifying. Having a problem put down in front of you that you have to deal with and you didn't choose, you can still make an earnest game about it, right? So can we find those opportunities and not do it just because, oh, well, you know, this is where our contract dictates, so I'll kind of do the bare minimum. Uh, or, oh, you know, we'll get it done because it doesn't really matter what we make. We'll just be able to talk about it. It's about my, you know, my boss or my contact getting to, to say that they experimented in a certain way. There must be some way to eke out those moments of earnestness, even if the whole thing doesn't come together, right? To kind of find that little bit of white space and, and pursue it. I think, I think we can still do that at least. In the front here. So the question is basically, if I can summarize, well, you know, how do we how do we create sort of categories of games in order that we know what we're what we're engaging with, and so that we can we can treat it for what it is rather than for not being a big AAA game. And I feel you, I've been there. Uh, I mean, what we really need are these uh, these kind of serious engagements with different genres of game. So if there are going to be these things called news games, then what do they look like, and how do we how do we develop them over time in order that we can really pursue? Uh, current events in, in game form. How do we communicate to our players? No, this is this is what we're doing. How do we frame that issue? How do we kind of invent and create those those spaces in which it can happen? That's not easy. Uh, it's not easy for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but th that's the sort of situation we need to set up, right? As, you know, one in which the games that we are making know very deliberately what they are and into kind of what slot of all of our lives they're 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 trying to they're trying to fit. And maybe, just maybe, it doesn't actually make any sense to get folks like us together to talk about games. Maybe we should be hanging out with the journalists. What we want to do is, is make news games. And say, oh, you know, there's games. I don't know, I make games sometimes. So we can make some games about the news. And in that context, those opportunities would work. Maybe we're fetishizing the game part of this too much. Because it's just not really a big deal to use writing when you're making news, right? We don't go to like, I don't know, you know, print, print newsprint conferences, whatever it would be. And partly that's because, well, this is what's taken for granted. But you get the point, right, which is that the more that we allow that, the medium itself to kind of recede into the background such that we're really deploying it in the context in which it matters, um, then, then the more natural those, uh, those couplings might be. You're never going to convince the Call of Duty player that they really want to play Endgame Syria in, in, instead. And, and they shouldn't have to make that choice. They sh that, we should never enter into a conversation where they make that choice. And the more we confuse these different categories, uh, the, the worse it gets, maybe. Maybe one more question? I, I don't know who was next. We'll go right here in the middle, yes. That's here, yeah. Yes, you. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's gotten his, his share of questions in over the years. Yeah. <laughs> for change or serious games or games for health or whatever reached a level of maturity such that now we can kind of move move beyond and that would be a very generous way of, of summarizing my talk. I think I'll, I'll let you have it. Okay, with that I think I think we're out of time. Thanks very much.